Um, I want to show you this uh, old picture that I uh, remembered. I took it in 2016 from uh, this is Thierry Cocon. He was presenting the uh, the cubicle model of, uh, of 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 type theory, um, and one of his big insights was, or one of his uh, uh, insights that helped him uh, making this was the fact that uh, path type is not the same as the identity type. And um, I want to uh, I, I want to mention this because I'm going to call uh, the paths. I'm going to call them also identifications. And uh, paths for me, they are really um, maps out of an interval object. So they're defined um, uh, relative to an interval object. And in cubicle type theory, that interval object is kind of uh, um, uh, given uh, synthetically, uh, yeah, um, primitively. And, and then the path objects will be equivalent to the identity types. But this is not the only way. And where I uh, um, studied at CMU, we decided at some point, no, we should really call these elements of the identity type identifications because um, there, there may be other uh, objects that we want to consider to be the uh, interval object. And the most uh, notable one is the uh, interval from zero to one in the real numbers. If you use that as your interval objects, then your paths will be topological paths and, um, <clears throat> and they will not be equivalent to the identity type. But, um, but uh, there is uh, um, uh, some kind of special aspect in type theory that gets um, mostly ignored in when you first learn about homotopy type theory that becomes much more uh, visible when, when you consider the, uh, the, the other kind of uh, interval objects. So uh, it's useful to uh, separate the terminology and I'm going to call them identifications. Um, and uh, I just thought it was a great picture of Cherry. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to introduce you to the idea of higher inductive types. Um, they're uh, like inductive types, but um, now they don't only have point constructors, but you can also have constructors that uh, are elements of the identity types or even higher identity types. And the basic example uh, of this lecture is the circle. That was also one of the first examples of um, uh, historically of higher inductive types at all. Um, and then uh, there will be an induction principle just like for ordinary inductive types. But um, uh, if you remember uh, how induction principles work, they, they kind of um, tell you that, that you have to do something for each of the constructors. And now there are both point constructors and identity constructors. Um, so in each case, uh, there will be a clause in the induction principle um, how to do that. So what we're going to do in this lecture, what we're going to see is that um, how do you figure out yourself what the induction principle of a uh, higher inductive type should be? Because that's really useful. If you do it in the uh, cubicle proof assistant, it's like done for you and you don't really uh, know what the induction principle is because uh, it, uh, the system takes care, care um, uh, for you of, of that, um, even allows you to do pattern matching. But it's, it's good to, uh, to see what it is. Um, and uh, the reason why we introduce higher inductive types is because it uh, introduces a large amount of uh, interesting spaces into um, homotopy type theory. So the circle will be the topic here. You will see the spheres. At the end of the day, we'll see the projective spaces. There are other CW complexes. Uh, Anders mentioned yesterday that he had a Klein bottle in cubicle ACDA. Um, there is also the construction of the eilenberg maclean spaces which are very important um, in synthetic homotopy theory. Um, you'll see push out suspensions. Um, there, there's a construction in homotopy called the, the wedge of the types and the smash product and so on. These are all constructions from classical homotopy theory that we can do in type theory. More generally, uh, there are homotopy co-limits and also um, universal constructions in algebra you can uh, often uh, do those with higher inductive types uh, using quotients. And um, <clears throat> if you're bored with set quotients, then you can do groupoid quotients. 
or even higher groupoid quotients if you have a um, if you have a strong sense of persistence and never want to give up, then you can do two two groupoid quotients or three groupoid quotients, but they they get uh, very technical very quickly. Um, <clears throat> the truncations for all n, rest completions, localization, and so on. There's lots of things you can make with higher inductive types, and it really makes homotopy type theory a very rich setting for doing mathematics. All right, so that's the idea. The circle is uh, is one of the simplest higher inductive types. It just has one point constructor. It's S1, and it has one identification uh, as a constructor, and that's the loop. And the loop goes from the base to the base. And the picture is very simple. And you immediately see from the picture that it uh, should be a circle. Um, and one of the things we're going to see is um, is that indeed it, this we can think of this as a circle and it's not going to be a contractible type this was a question by some of you at the beginning of this week why is the circle not contractible we're going to see today why that is <clears throat> okay um the problem now is that we have to figure out what the induction principle for the circle is and um and if you think about it in the right way, then you um, then then you realize that uh, it's not really a hard thing um, to formulate. You could you could have done it yourself. So in general, an induction principle tells you how to construct a dependent function out of the inductive type. So if you have a family P over your higher inductive type then you want to be able to construct an, a dependent function for every x and x, p of x. That's your goal. Okay, so um, then, uh, then what, you, what should you do to, um, to get that? Well, the question uh, to ask is, well, suppose I had a dependent function. Um, what kind of structure do I get if I apply my dependent function to the constructors and the, the point constructors and the path constructors? What kind of structure do I get? And the idea is that this dependent function should be uniquely determined by that data that you get from applying it to the point constructor and the uh, path constructor or identity constructors. Um, so, um, but now there are not, uh, only point constructors and also there are also path constructors. So we need to know what it means to apply a dependent function to an identification in, uh, in the space X. And we saw yesterday in, um, in, the proof, in the cubicle proof assistant with Anders that there was this uh, path P and, uh, and there was this way of applying F to the path. Um, but that was in the cubicle setting. And so here I'm just going to show you again how to do it in the more synthetic uh, homotopy theory setting. Um, so there is this notion of the dependent action on paths of f. So we have f, a dependent function, and we have some uh, path uh, identification p from x to y. And, uh, and we want to apply f to p. Well, we know where the endpoints go. f of x goes to p of x, and f of y goes to p of y. These types are different, but we can transport f of x to the type of p of y. Um, and then we can ask, are they equal? And uh, yes, they're going to be equal, because p is a, a free path. You can. Um, do a path induction on it. And, uh, and in the case of raffle, they are really the same thing. Uh, so you get uh, uh, by reflexivity uh, your answer. So, so the dependent action on paths in uh, synthetic homotopy theory, it computes only on raffle. And in that case, it's reflexivity. OK. Um, for some reason, I don't see any chat at the moment. I'm sorry. I thought I uh, set it up in such a way that here. <clears throat> uh, okay. 
Now I can keep an eye on the chat. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now back to the circle. Uh, if we have a dependent function on the circle for some dependent type over it, then if we apply it to the uh, point constructors, we get f of base. This is in p of base. And we get the dependent action on that applied to loop. And this uh, goes uh, from f of base to f of base, but the first one you transport it. And, um, and here you see that, okay, we could have asked f, uh, just simply f of base equals f of base. Um, but uh, but that's not really what you want. You want the um, the new identification. The new identification is going to be over the loop, so it's going to be this dependent action on that. Um, and uh, and now we see that uh, we get a map out of the pi type by evaluating uh, uh, f to base and loop. So this map goes uh, from uh, from the dependent function type to the type of pairs <clears throat> where uh, we get a u in p of base and an identification from uh, the transport along loop of u to u. Uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't pay attention to the chat. <laughs> um, but uh, this is, okay, so this is kind of just an evaluation map. You can think of it like that. And all what the induction principle of S1 says is that this map here has a section. It means that you can go back from this type here to the type of dependent functions. And moreover, if you start on this side, you go back and you apply your evaluation, you get back at the same thing. That's the computation rule. And it gets even better because not only this map has a section, it's actually an equivalence. It's something you can prove from the induction principle or you can prove the induction principle from the dependent universal property. So this map is an equivalence. And the fact that this is an equivalence is called the dependent universal property of S1. So that's, um, that's the technicality of it. So let's see a picture how that's supposed to work top, uh, geometrically. Uh, so we have um, the circle in, uh, at the bottom here. And uh, here we have some family of types over it. It goes, it varies like this. All these fibers go around, uh, varying over the loop. And we start with um, this red point U in P of base. And, uh, and starting from U, we can transport it along the loop. We go around and ah, we might end up somewhere else, <clears throat> but we end up at least in the same fiber. Then the second piece of data that, uh, that we need to provide is this identification from here to there. So, okay, if there is this identification, then along loop, we can actually transport this whole identification da, 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 like that uh, along the loop. And we get some kind of a square and, uh, and it meets, uh, it meets this point here again. <clears throat> and that's important because that's the reason why there is this section now. How can you get the section is, well, you start here and you kind of go over the diagonal of this square around over the loop and you see that you end up at the same point. And that's exactly a section uh, of the family, continuous section. Uh, so this is the reason why the induction principle works also topologically. Um, and uh, and from now on, you can just use the type theory to to get it. But this is really the the picture uh, behind the induction principle of S one. Are there any questions about this? Uh, Ten more minutes. Okay. So how do you use this dependent universal property? Uh, okay, so suppose we have this uh, u and this p, um, uh, like uh, like in the picture. So suppose you have u and this path. Um, then you get a unique dependent function that comes equipped with an identification. F of base is u. 
and um, and a commuting square. And this commuting square uh, is relating the dependent action on on um, on paths of f. This one it relates it back to uh, the p that was part of the data that we started with. Uh, so here you say that uh, so there's one computation rule for uh, this uh, for this aspect and there's one computation rule for that one and that last one is a commuting square. Um, and uh, and that may look a bit uh, complicated, but um, this is how it is. And you can just, um, it is possible to, to work with this. There's not really a problem with it. Uh, it really helps that, um, that, it's, uh, that it's a dependent universal property and not only an induction principle. So you have the uniqueness uh, also. Um, but a special case is when the y doesn't depend on uh, an element on a variable of type uh, S1. Uh, and here, uh, the universal property, the dependent universal property simplifies, and you you get a much uh, more pleasant situation. You get an evaluation map from this type of functions. You try it to base, and you use the ordinary action on paths uh, of f about the loop, and you get a loop from f of base to f of base without any uh, complicated transports. And uh, this map is again an equivalence. And this space here is also known as the free loop space on Y because it's kind of the uh, all the it's the total space of all the loop spaces. Uh, the beta square can also be phrased as an identification involving transport along alpha. Uh, let's have a look. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, Yes, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, let's go back to this type here. We get an identification in this sigma type. And the first component of that identification will be an identification in the base here. And then by the characterization of the, uh, of the identity type of sigma types, the second component will be uh, a transport along alpha is identified with, uh, with something. So uh, that's, that's exactly right. Um, it's uh, it's not so helpful though. Uh, you want to get rid of that uh, transport. Um, one of the um, philosophies that I have um, is that you want to avoid transport um, where you can as much as possible. And here in the definition of S1 in, in the universal property, we cannot really avoid it. I mean, we can do something equivalent like considering a path over. Um, but it doesn't really um, do super very much if you do everything up to homotopy, um, in my experience at least. Um, so you kind of want to um, uh, to uh, just work with computed transports all the time. So that's why I draw this as a square. It's kind of the transport is already computed for you. Uh, alpha is the diagonal. Um, let's see, no, let's see in this picture, we get, um, so let's, yeah, we, we get kind of, uh, F of base will be somewhere near here, like up to how much B will be around this point. Then it will go here, uh, in this fiber. Um, so it's kind of the blue arrow up to how much B. Does that help, Violetta? Okay, great. Um... I, I also have a question in the previous slide. Um... I hear someone, but it's very bad quality sound, so I yeah, don't hear it's... what you say. Maybe it's better, Gabriel, if you write it in the chat or you. You have to configure your mic better. Yeah, let's just finish the story while he's typing um, about the universal property. If you want to use it, then you start with a free loop in Y. So a choice of a base point and then a loop on that. And then you get the unique map from S1 to Y 
um, such that f of base is mapped to y and you get a commuting square. This commuting square looks a little bit friendlier than, than the other one. Um, uh, oh, um, okay, so yeah, so in a cubicle system, it makes sense that this is a strict equality. Um, for homotopy co-limits, um, not so much you do everything up to homotopy. And um, uh, yeah, it, it, it does buy you a little bit that the, the equality can be strict. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, if you work up to homotopy, you can also do everything weak. And that's, that's how I do it at this moment, yeah. Um, we get to more of that when we consider homotopy co-limits and the homotopy co-limit is really just characterized by, uh, by the universal property and nothing else. And the universal property states all the computation uh, rules uh, also weakly. So it's, um, it's good to get, uh, get used to it in a way because, um, because you want to kind of work with homotopy co-limits um, in the weakest possible sense because because that, when you work in that generality, you you can also apply your methods more generally. Um, moving on now because we need um, like two more minutes to do the multiplication operation. So the uh, circle, uh, you can also view it as the subspace of um, of the complex numbers, the the unit complex numbers. And uh, and those can does have a multiplication and the multiplication uh, uh, preserves the norm, and so um, when you multiply two uh, complex numbers that are both on the on the unit circle, then they stay on the unit circle. So there should be a multiplication operation on S one, and here we're gonna uh, use the uh, the induction principle of S one to get that um, uh, multiplication operation, and it satisfies uh, several laws. But let's just define it. Um, and uh, this is by the universal property of the circle. Uh, you see here that you have a map from S1 to some type. The some type is uh, maps from S1 to S1. But we can, uh, since we're mapping out of S1, we can apply the universal property. In the base case, we use the identity type. And, uh, um, uh, and in the uh, uh, case for the loop, we use an unknown. Uh, we leave this goal open, but we get a unique map equipped with uh, with this identification. So we already know that um, uh, the base is a, is a unit from when you multiply from the left. Um, and here, what do we have to do? Um, uh, uh, the uh, system is asking us to prove that um, the identity function is equal to itself. Uh, but here is um, um, actually function extensionality, or uh, yeah, it is. Um, and I, just one use of function extensionality says, okay, we have to show that the identity function is homotopic to itself. And of course, uh, there is the reflexivity homotopy, uh, but um, but uh, we had some uh, desired properties that we want, and we're not gonna uh, get uh, this one and this one if we use uh, h to be the reflexivity homotopy. So we're going to be a little bit careful. We're going to define it by hand. So recall that the type of homotopies from it to it is just the pi type for every x, x equals x. So we're going to use now the dependent universal property. And the family is going to be t of x, x uh, is x equals x. And, um, and here we say, OK, in the uh, base case, now uh, we have to construct a path from base to base, and that's going to be loop. We are not going to take raffle. That's what we just said. We're not going to take raffle. Um, and then in the uh, case for um, uh, for loop, we have to do again something annoying, namely deal with this uh, transport, but it's not so bad. So we, um, if we define this gamma here, uh, which is transport in P of um, a long loop, uh, we transport the loop itself, then we should get loop back in, in this uh, family. So let's think about how that goes. There's an observation you can make. Um, we're looking here for an equality between transports and P. That's also a path over. And we say, okay, oh, sorry, 
that we want to uh, kind of compute this bad buffer. And, um, and the general fact is that there's a function from P concatenate R equals Q concatenate P to the type of identifications here. And why is that? That is just true uh, for any uh, P from base to X and uh, Q and R. So Q is in the fiber over base and R is in the fiber over X and P goes from base to X. And you can do path induction on P because the endpoint is free. And if you have raffle here and raffle here, then and raffle here, then it just says R equals Q implies Q equals R. And that is just a triviality. So that's how you do it. And then, uh, and then in the case for loop, we want to have loop and loop and loop here, then it will just be loop concatenate loop is equal to loop concatenate loop implies this transport of loop along loop um, equals loop. And that's just this one, uh, we have here reflexivity. So we get, uh, we get the flat here. And that's how you define the complex multiplication on, on this circle. Um, I got some exercises here for the exercise session. And um, uh, I'll take some questions and otherwise we just have a five minute break right now. <laughs>